Hello and welcome to today's episode of Stand Up. I've got comedian Christian Finnegan joining me today. He's always awesome and today was no exception. If you want to skip to our interview over the news and clips, well, you're a bad person, but I totally understand and don't blame you. How about that? You can do it now. It starts at 27 minutes. Well, you miss out on all the great things I have to say and offer you in these first few minutes of today and every day's episode, including that I'll be headed to, looks like, Pennsylvania and Michigan. I'm trying to figure it out right now. I had so many unexpected things happen, and I am very eager to get out on the road and try to get out the vote for Democrats. So I will let you know in the email and in the Discord and right here on the podcast the moment I know exactly where I'm going to be, when I'm going to be there. Sorry for any confusion. Very happy to have you here joining me. Thank you for all of to all of you who joined me at last night's hangout we had uh over 50 people i think or maybe over 60 people at one point hanging out with us we were there for about three hours we had a great discussion played a lot of clips laughed made fun of each other and supported each other as always it was a great hangout and if you want to watch it relive it the link to that hangout is in the subscriber email if you're not a subscriber i wonder about you how did you get here how did you find yourself here how much of the show are you listening to could you speak Spare five dollars or more a month. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic to get all the benefits of being a subscriber. And I'm very grateful, so grateful to everyone who already is. All right, here we go. Let's get to it. Time for your headlines. I think I have to say the biggest story from yesterday is that the leader of Hamas is dead. His name is Yawa Sinwar. He was the chief architect of the October 7th attack and... Yesterday, he was killed in a firefight with Israeli troops who unexpectedly encountered him in southern Gaza. The troops, which were backed by drones, because that's where we're at in modern day warfare, came upon a small group of Hamas fighters and brought down part of a building that they had taken over. The Israeli troops found Sinwar's body in the rubble. The significance of his death can't be underscored for Israel, Hamas, Gaza and the Middle East. But it remains unclear exactly what this means for the future of this conflict. Reasons for a deal, reasons for no deal. I think that the Biden administration has to press the Israeli government and leadership, Netanyahu, and any remaining Hamas officials to end the war in Gaza, return hostages to the families, surge humanitarian aid into the territory, and urgently take other steps to ensure that Gazans have adequate shelter, supplies, and security as winter approaches. I'm reading at least one opinion that says that. Matt Duss at the Center for International Policy thinks that. I absolutely agree, but what the hell do I know. Israel spent months looking for this guy. In the end, a training unit on patrol apparently encountered him in southern Gaza. The Israeli military official released drone footage that said it showed him sitting in a chair shortly before he was killed. Did you see that? Crazy video. They used dental records and fingerprints to help identify his body. There's no debate over or not whether or not it was him or if he's dead because they are already making him a martyr in Iran and obviously in Gaza and elsewhere. Biden congratulated Netanyahu, said Sinwar's death could create the opportunity to move on to a ceasefire. He said he was sending the Secretary of State to discuss plans for securing Gaza. Netanyahu, in a video address, said that Israel would continue its military campaign against Hamas. This is not the end of the war in Gaza. It is just the beginning of the end, he said. For the families of hostages, the news brought satisfaction as well as concern for the fate of the captives. And that was a huge headline and a little bit of analysis around it from yesterday. Every day you hear more interviews and speeches that the candidates give. The disgraced former president was on a podcast yesterday where he said that he blamed Volodymyr Zelensky for Russia's invasion of Ukraine, said that that Zelensky and Ukraine never should have let that war start which makes absolutely no sense because Russia invaded Ukraine. We found out yesterday that Mitch McConnell apparently privately called Trump stupid. (gasps) I am shocked, said he was a despicable human being. I am just really surprised and aghast at that. And this was after the 2020 election. According to the Associated Press, McConnell responded to the article by saying, well, J.D. Vance and Lindsey Graham said worse things about Trump, but we're all on the same team now. Ugh, so disgusting. As for the Harris campaign, she uh, was with Mark Cuban in Wisconsin, making her sixth visit to the state since entering the race. She accused Trump, who recently described January 6th as a day of love of gaslighting Americans. 
talked policy and what she wants to do for the American people. And in more news, the Biden administration yesterday announced it had forgiven federal student loan debt for more than one million public service workers, which is an amazing story and news. I love that. U.S. prosecutors charged a man they identified as an Indian intelligence officer with trying to orchestrate an assassination on U.S. soil from abroad. The Texas Supreme Court halted the execution of a man convicted of killing his two-year-old daughter. The case has drawn scrutiny because of the role that shaken baby syndrome played in his conviction. The U.S. military struck five underground weapons facilities in areas of Yemen controlled by the Iranian-backed Houthi militia on Wednesday using warplanes that included the B-2 stealth bombers in an attack that could serve as a warning to Iran as well. And I think I mentioned this yesterday, but worth mentioning it again. In the latest series of settlements, the Archdiocese, the Catholic Church of Los Angeles, the nation's largest branch, Archdiocese, has agreed to pay $880 million to 1,353 people who say they were sexually abused as children by Catholic clergy. The settlement, which experts said is the highest single payout by a diocese, brings Los Angeles' cumulative total in sex abuse lawsuits to more than $1.5 billion. And finally, here's a fun headline. The chief judge, a chief judge of the Northern District of Florida, granted a temporary restraining order against Florida's Surgeon General after the state health department threatened to bring criminal charges against broadcasters airing an ad that they didn't like. The controversy, this controversy stems from a campaign ad by the group Floridians Protecting Freedom, which is behind the Yes on 4 campaign, promoting a ballot measure that seeks to overturn Florida's six weeks abortion ban by enshrining abortion rights in the state's constitution. In the 30 second ad, a brain cancer survivor named Caroline says the state law would have prevented her from receiving a life saving abortion. Well, the state Florida State Health Department brought criminal charges against the broadcasters who aired the ad. But a federal judge said, and I quote in his decision to keep it simple for the state of Florida. It's the First Amendment. Stupid. He wrote It's the First Amendment, stupid. On Thursday, yesterday, the judge agreed the health department's threats were, quote, viewpoint discrimination and wrote that the group presented a substantial likelihood of proving an ongoing violation of its First Amendment rights through the threat and direct penalization of its political speech. So I thought that was good news. I like to hear that. Vote for choice in Florida. They want to silence any opinion they don't agree with from K through 12 to college. They don't even want you to mention the words climate change. Talk about censorship and political correctness and all the projection that the right is constantly saying about the left regarding language. It's them. It's always been them. And those are yesterday's headlines. Now let's get to some of the clips I've got for you. First, Let's listen to Kamala Harris' reaction to the death of the leader of Hamas. Israel has a right to defend itself, and the threat Hamas poses to Israel must be eliminated. Today, there is clear progress toward that goal. Hamas is decimated, and its leadership is eliminated. This moment gives us an opportunity to finally end the war in Gaza. And it must end such that Israel is secure. The hostages are released. The suffering in Gaza ends. And the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, security, freedom, and self-determination. And it is time for the day after to begin without Hamas in power. We will not give up on these goals. And I will always work to create a future of peace, dignity, and security for all. I thank you all. Colin Harris yesterday reading a statement about the death of the leader of Hamas. And obviously the days and hours after are going to be really interesting to see what happens there. Now let's get some reaction from folks in media about the interview with Kamala Harris and Brett Baer of Fox News. I want to give you a few different takes First, here is Brian Stelter over on CNN talking to the wolf, Wolf Blitzer. I I totally agree, Ashley. I think this strategy from Harris was a Google strategy. She wanted Fox viewers to start to Google some of the things she was saying, because some of the comments she was making in this interview are foreign to the Fox audience. For example, 
General Mark Milley saying Trump is a fascist to the core. That's barely been covered on Fox News. So she was able to get some of those talking mm-hmm. points in. This was the most adversarial interview Kamala Harris has probably ever done. Instead of getting to debate Trump again, she got to debate Brett Baer. And a lot of viewers are going to come away saying, wow, she's willing to do that. That's a sign of toughness and strength. Yeah, it's uh, impressive indeed, Ari. Exactly. I, think, I totally agree, Ashley. I think this strategy from Harris was a Google strategy. She wanted Fox viewers to start to Google some of the things she was saying, because some of the comments she was making in this interview are foreign to the Fox audience. For example, General Mark Milley saying Trump is a fascist to the core. That's barely been covered on Fox News. So she was able to get some of those talking mm-hmm. points in. This was the most adversarial interview Kamala Harris has probably ever done. Instead of getting to debate Trump again, she got to debate Brett Baer. And a lot of viewers are going to come away saying, wow, she's willing to do that. That's a sign of toughness and strength. All right. There is Brian Stelter on CNN. And here's another take. And for some reason, I cannot find out who this one was. I forget. I pulled the audio. I don't know what it was, but I like the commentary. That was a home run because she sent the one message that needs to be sent, which was, I will go anywhere at any time and show the courage necessary to speak to every American because that's what a real president does. The primary critique against her prior to this point was that she was not doing enough interviews. No one thought that the Fox News interview was going to go swimmingly every step of the way. Everyone knew it would be adversarial, Mm. but she showed exactly what she needed to show, which was that she is a leader ready to be president on day one. All right, there you go. And now finally, here is Pete Buttigieg on the reaction to Kamala Harris's interview on Fox News, where he always shines when he's on. But given that you have such experience with going on Fox, I mean, did you give her any advice about this interview beforehand? I wasn't involved in her interview prep. Uh, what I will say is that, you know, one pr- principle I try to remember uh, that I thought she demonstrated is uh, making sure not to allow them to kind of change the subject or the framing of the question at hand, right? The whole topic there was the fact that a candidate for president and a former U.S. president described the American people, the ones he disagreed with, as the enemy. And it's really important not to uh, allow some sidestepping of that. So, you know, she she did that. She also uh, made sure to continue to get her point across, even when she was being uh, repeatedly interrupted. Uh, as somebody who uh, has a lot of batting practice myself uh, on that network, uh, really proud of, of how she represented her views, her values, uh, and this ticket in front of a conservative audience. Something I might add, by the way, that is uh, a show of strength that is the a- exact opposite of the weakness that Donald Trump has demonstrated. By uh, pulling out of going even on CNBC, uh, which is you know, hardly a, a, a liberal bastion, uh, or 60 Minutes, uh, where uh, it's, it's customary for both candidates to go on. He's not prepared to go in front of uh, a, uh, a skeptical, let alone uh, unfriendly audience. She demonstrated the opposite. And remember, this is in keeping with her continued outreach to conservatives. Look at the difference uh, between her making clear that she would include Republicans in her cabinet campaigning with so many Republicans, principal Republicans who are for her versus him uh, referring to Democrats as the enemy. Buttigieg, you've been Buttigieg'd. There you go. That is some of the reaction from Kamala Harris's interview on Fox News. And now let's go to Kamala Harris herself. She was campaigning yesterday at a rally in, I think, I think it was Michigan. Where was she? It doesn't matter as much as the clip does because she was getting heckled by apparently some MAGA Trump supporters. And this was her reaction, which went absolutely viral yesterday. Oh, you guys are at the wrong rally. <laughs> You meant to go to the smaller one down the street. All right, there you go. Kamala Harris yesterday, and I thought that was great. Probably the most viral clip I saw yesterday. I thought this was a feel-good statistical analysis. This is the Midas Touch Network. Simon Rosenberg was on, and he was crunching some of the numbers, which I thought were really important about early voting. This is about a a three-and-a-half-minute clip, but I think it'll make you feel positive, and uh, so I wanted to share it with you. 
In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, their absentee ballots, the return ballots, Democrats, 416,000, the GOP, 158,000, and Democrats are returning these ballots at a much higher rate. You look at what just took place in Georgia, setting records on the first day of early voting, blowing away past records, 305,000 ballots cast, and you start looking at the counties um, like Fulton County, Cobb County, DeKalb County, Gwinnett County. Um, and then you look at the, uh, the gender, 54.4% female. That's in Georgia. You take yeah. a look at what's going on in Michigan. Nearly 800,000 people have now voted there with Detroit absentee ballot returns rocking at nearly 45%, 9% higher than the statewide average. You take a look. This is, it's, you start to see a trend, right? And you start yeah. to see patterns developing. What are you seeing there? Yeah. I mean, the early vote, it's interesting. The early vote in this election is going to look a lot like 2024. <laughs> And not 2020 or 2022. It's like every election, it's got its own unique kind of, and I, um, sort of manifestations. And I've been a little bit slow to analyze it because it's, first of all, it's still very early. And also it, there are certain things that are going as we want. There are other things that are, you know, we have to pay attention to. But what's most important is this, is that from the votes that have come in nationally, we are still running ahead of 2020 at this point. Uh, and then we won in 2020. So that's a very good sign. We also expect and anticipate that the independent vote is going to be a little bit more democratic this time because a lot of young people who are voting democratic have registered as independent. So when you look at the poll results of Democrat, Republican, and independent, we don't know how those independents are going to vote, but they're, they're likely to be marginally more democratic than they were. And we also expect that we're going to get a, a, some of those Republicans are voting. We're going to get some of them too, right? So when you look at the D, R, and I numbers, it's very possible that we're going to get a little bit more from the R's and the I's than just what we're getting from the D's, right? This is something we'll we'll learn. We'll find out as we get further into this. And so the fact that we could have this like little bit of a hidden vote in the I's and, and the R's and we're ahead nationally of where we were in 2020 at this point is very encouraging. Second, as you pointed out, in the early state, in the battleground seven states, we're doing much better than 2020. Uh, and where the, the all star so far is Michigan. I mean, Michigan is the Democratic vote there is performing unbelievably well. We're doing well in Pennsylvania. We're doing well in Wisconsin. Um, and we'll find out we just early voting is just beginning now in the other four states. North Carolina starts tomorrow, Thursday. We just started in Georgia yesterday. Arizona just began. So we'll start getting much more data in those other states. But so far, so good. Steady as she goes, right? It's And what's really important, Ben, and we talked a lot about this in 2022, what everyone needs to realize who's watching today is that it's very important that you vote early. Vote as early as you can. Because when you vote early, you come off the GOTV rolls for the campaign. They know every night who's voted that day, not how you voted, but that you voted. And when you come off the GOTV rolls, it allows the campaign to move to lower propensity voters quicker. If they move to lower propensity voters quicker and start talking to them now, it's more likely they vote for us. So when you vote early, you actually can increase Democratic turnout, make more Democrats, and make it more likely we win. So if you have a choice between voting on Election Day or voting near Election Day and voting right now, vote right now. It's more important that you vote now and that we attempt to run up the score in October, as we did in 2022, and win this election in October in the early vote and not wait till Election Day. There you go. All right. How does that make you feel? I like it. Vote now, vote early, and tell your friends. Now let's go to Bill Clinton, who is on the campaign trail in Georgia for Kamala Harris, where I have this soundbite for you. A rare Clinton bite. I wish I hadn't said that. I don't have any more elections I'll be involved with, and I'm too old to gild the lily. Heck, I'm only two months younger than Donald Trump. <laughs> but <laughs> good news for you is I will not spend 30 minutes swaying back and forth to you. I've played enough music, I will not clap off beat. 
No, well, I pretend to be a conductor <laughs> because we got a race to win, and we have to win it. I've been doing this a long, long time, and I can honestly say that this time I am not here running for anything anymore except for my grandchildren's future. All right, there he goes, talking about his grandchildren's future. Now let's go to the vice presidential nominee, the governor of Minnesota. It's Tim Walls yesterday. I'm, I'm taking nothing on this. I'm a veteran. I'm a hunter. I went pheasant hunting last weekend. I own firearms. Kamala Harris owns firearms. This might be the, I don't know, President Clinton, this might be the first, this might be the first time that both Democrats on the ticket are gun owners right now. And it might also be the first time that the guy on the other side can't pass a background check because he has felonies. And let's listen to one more surrogate for Kamala Harris. This is Mark Cuban, who seems to really enjoy campaigning for her. A businessman, a billionaire, a white guy, and a pretty effective communicator. Here he is. That small businesses are an integral part of our community, that we grow up with them. And she wants to help those businesses grow because she knows that maybe one of you here right now will start a business that turns into the next Google, that turns into the next Nike. And I want all of you to just ask yourself, why not me? Why can't I be the one that starts that, that business? Why can't I be the one that changes the world because I took that first step to start that business and Kamala Harris helped me take that first step. That's why what she is doing is so important. You know, in my career, I've learned a lot about business, including how tariffs work. Now, let me just ask you a question. Do you all know anybody who doesn't know how tariffs work? All right, I'll give you a hint. That other guy. Now, he has this crazy, crazy, crazy notion that putting a tariff of 60% on every single product imported from China is a good idea. Let me just tell you. This man has so little understanding of tariffs, he thinks that China pays for them. This is the same guy who also thought that Mexico would pay for the wall. So there's no Mexico. Did Mexico pay for that wall? Hell no, you said it wrong. Hell no. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, there it is. And one more clip from Kamala Harris yesterday, which I thought was important. Here it is that he made just in the last few days because he, he just he's got more <laughs> he said he will target and punish those who disagree with him or refuse to bend to his will he calls these Americans the enemy within and says that he would use the American military to go after American citizens. Journalists whose stories he doesn't like. Nonpartisan election officials who refuse to cheat by finding a few extra votes for him. Judges who insist on following the law instead of following him. It is for reasons like these that General Mark Milley the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Donald Trump's top general, has called Trump, and I quote, fascist to the core. (laughs) And it is clear, Donald Trump is increasingly unstable and unhinged and will stop at nothing to claim unchecked power for himself. He wants to send the military after American citizens. He wants to prevent women from making decisions about their own body. 
He wants to threaten fundamental freedoms and rights like the freedom to vote, the freedom to be safe from gun violence, to breathe clean air and drink clean water, and the freedom to love who you love openly and with pride. In this election, so much is on the line. Absolutely right. And uh, I think I've got one more here for you. Yeah, this is Snoop Dogg. A lot of you love this on social media as well as when I played it at the Hangout last night. This is not a new clip. I think this is from a few years back, maybe even. But it's the first time I've seen it or that I remember seeing it. Snoop was on Sirius XM. I don't even know who this is or what show he was on. But it doesn't matter. It speaks for itself. It's real good. The N word is involved, so uh, be prepared. It's real. All right, politics, real quick. Now we all. Hate, I apologize. Nah, I really don't apologize, man, because a lot of my fans get mad at me when I talk bad about them. But I don't. I think it's safe to say most people in our culture do not. Well, you need to know Trump. that. You need to know that a lot of your fans is racist. Ain't no See, fucking way around. Don't even try to put no. I don't cut. Even want to put I, anything around. I, it I do. I don't give a fuck. I yeah. tell him straight up, motherfucker. If you like that nigga, you motherfucking racist. Fuck you and fuck him. Now what? All right. If you draw the line, nigga. He drew the lines. Exactly. He drew the motherfucking lines. Before him, there were no lines. Everybody was everybody. We respected everything. We didn't trip. But nigga, when you drew the line, nigga, start pointing motherfuckers out and saying, nigga, fuck y'all then, nigga. Yeah, that's how I feel. You and them. If you're just tuning in, we're talking Kanye about Kanye too, Trump. nigga. Don't forget about him too. Fuck you too. Ooh, yeah. I love it. Snoop laying it down. That was very, very good. And to Kanye as well. All right. Finally, here is a little comedy for you. It's Jimmy Kimmel's monologue last night. Uh, <laughs> Donald Trump is all over the place right now, both literally and figuratively. He's canceled a number of high profile television appearances in favor of cozy, friendly chats with the wannabe bro Rogans of the podcasting world. I'm learning about all these weird right-wing swamp creatures lately, thanks to Donald Trump. None of these guys, and none of them spend even a minute pushing back on his nonsense. He says whatever he wants. Today he was on something called the PBD podcast, where he told the host how much black people like him. Black men really like me. And I think black women do too. But they have a woman who is black, well, you would say she's Indian, but uh, she is black. But she really, a lot of people didn't know, which mm -hmm. is true. And by true, I believe you mean not true. It's, <laughs> no one didn't know that. OK, Trump loves to be the keeper of information he thinks no one else has. Chocolate is very bad for dogs. A lot of people don't know that. No one knows how short February is. February is very short. <laughs> But while his brain may be softening, it is very fertile. His brain is as fertile as a turtle. Did you think you were going to say fake news? Or was it just kind of came out and then it stuck? You're like, this is going to stick. Was it intentional? I, I was don't it... know if that's the first time I've used it. But I do get credit for having, you know, having been an originator of the term. I mean, you know, a lot of times I come up with, I have a very fertile mind. I come up with very good names for people. Very creative. Pocahontas. Yes. Lots of good names. It's very fertile. It's, it's literally full of fertilizer. <laughs> Yesterday. All right, there you go. Let me get back in here. Thank you, Jimmy Kimmel, and thank you to all of those people whose clips I played and to you for listening to them. But now it's time to get to my conversation with Christian Finnegan, who hasn't been here in a few weeks. I love to wrap up the week with him. I love to talk with him about anything as evidence from the first few minutes of this conversation. He's always interesting and thoughtful and original, and he's doing good work right now to try to get out the vote in Pennsylvania. We talked about how you can get more involved as well and much more. Christian Finnegan, of course, writes the newsletter New Music for Olds. If you like music and even if you don't like music like like me, I love music, but I just don't know how to talk about it. So I, I shouldn't say I don't like it. I love it. It's always on in my house. I don't know how to talk about it. But this newsletter has gone a long way for people like me that don't know as many artists and those who do as well it's perfect go subscribe to new music for olds.substack.com follow christian on social media and get his specials buy his comedy specials watch them they're very very funny see him live any chance you can get he's one of my favorites let's do it right now with christian finnegan yeah finnegan fridays hey woo <laughs> Just, I don't know. I opened my mouth, and that was the sound that came out. I have no excuse for it. 
I wanted to tell you that I'm trying to be a better father and a better man by my why you tell your daughters this and not me. Why are you telling me? <laughs> they know. They know this is why. Christian uh, Finnegan, random childless comedian. I just want to let you know I'm trying to be a better father. This is why you'll be impressed. Maybe. Okay. Ava said to me a couple weeks ago that she wanted to take her sister to the Billie Eilish concert in Madison Square Garden. I was like, you absolutely should go. I'll, I'll buy the tickets. But I feel bad because I never took them to a concert. And so I bought the tickets, as are all tickets. They're pretty expensive for tickets to things. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who can possibly afford these things. You have to save up forever. And I did. And they had an amazing time at the Billie Eilish concert. And I didn't go with them because I thought better just to create that moment for them. And it yeah, worked. they're not they're not nine anymore. Like, you know, right. yeah, that's um, where I'm looking for my award that I finally took or at least bought tickets for my daughters for a musical live musical concert, something I never did and carry around shame. I think I did a really good job of my girls in terms of trying to do things and be present, and give them opportunities. But that's something I missed. That is a lot to go on a coffee mug. I'm not going to lie to you rather than just world's best dad. I really tried to get my daughters a lot. I didn't finally got the tickets to a concert, which I never had the time to go to. And they had a great time and I didn't want to. Yeah, it's a lot. Just really small font. <laughs> Congratulations on being a good dad. Yeah, it's going to. Did you go to concerts like growing up? Not did a you lot. have a, Not a lot. Like my, my parents. Did, or something? No, my per, my parents didn't. What did you say? Like an amphitheater. Like we had like a Worcester Centrum. Did yeah, you yeah. have the big. What the was Syracuse. the Syracuse concert venue? Yeah, the Syracuse War Memorial, the Syracuse Civic Center. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. The, the Carrier Dome. But I didn't, I would go to, I saw uh, my first and only concert growing up was when I was a teenager. I went to see Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers at the Syracuse War Memorial. That's pretty good. If you're going to have just one concert experience, that's a pretty good one to drop. Yeah. yeah. My very first concert was the Monkees Reunion Tour. Really? Which I, I had so angry that that was my first concert. Yeah, so I was dating a girl in eighth grade who was super into them. And so I went on her behest. And did then, guys, did we what? Did you hook up? We made out. I think I, we very briefly went to, I think she was the first girl I ever went to third base with. That's great. And then two weeks later, she literally broke up with me for a guy who was in Up With People. Oh. During the intermission of the Up With People concert, a German dude named Rolf. You can't she was 14. A German <laughs> so, Christian. Yeah. Did you did you have Up With People? Did, did you know what that is? Uh, yeah, it's like a youth Christian group, I think. Not they may honestly they may have been Christian. It didn't occur to me at the time, but they would they have like people from various countries and they would just they were all about global friendship and let's now we'll have people dance around to Chinese music for 30 seconds, and then we'll have people dance around to whatever, do German beer garden music or whatever. Later, people with lederhosen would run out and do a little jig, and everybody took turns. It was a, like a live Epcot Center. Uh, I might, I'm, I'm looking it up. I, I might be wrong about it in terms of the... It definitely gave off youth Christian, youth pastor vibes. I don't know. I just don't know if it was. At the 1990s, up with people's themed musical style spectacles were frequently lambasted by critics and mocked by television writers for being dated and seeming phony, if not outright creepy. Yes, yeah. I would agree with all that. Those and this seem... was probably 86, something yeah. like that, 87. I remember a girl that I liked was in that group. And I, I think I thought about joining it. For some reason, I was like, ah, I'm good. I got turned off. By I something. think you made a right decision. Yeah. It, it, uh, it, well, in, in the fact that this dude, this German dude, Rolf was going around, I'm sure that Bonnie, this girl who I was dating, I'm sure he was not the only literal freshman in high school that he was hooking up with around the country. Like what a real scumbag sort of lifestyles to be like, I'm all about global friendship. Now let me finger your daughters. Suburban yeah. Massachusetts. Sounds, yeah, I feel like if you're a young European or any really exchange student and you came to America in the 80s and 90s, you probably did pretty good with, if you're halfway decent looking girl or boy, yeah. you probably did pretty good because you're so different and that's sexy and cool. Like we had that definitely with a couple of uh, exchange students. And going to Europe too, like I always, I've always been of the opinion that college girls, women, college women, many of them go to Europe to be who guys are all the time. Do you know what I mean? It's like they go to Europe. Part of the adventure of a of a European trip when you're in college or whatever is to hook up and just be a bit of a uh, bon vivant, shall we say? Some might say trollop, 
I was dating a girl. We were, I wasn't in college, but it was, I was probably 25, 26. And she was going to go to Europe for six weeks. And I broke up with her. And I just said, if when you come back, if we want to start dating, great. But I'm not going to sit here in America while you're traipsing around Europe with your friend, your female friend, like going hog wild, literally. No, I, I, get I, I just didn't want to. I, it's, I've seen this movie before. I know how this is going to go. And not only did she hook up with somebody when she was in Europe, she got pregnant from him. Wow. So I feel like I'd made the, the right decision. I think it's strange how you ended up wording that pregnant from him. I don't know why it made me laugh, but inside, by him, I guess by him, would that I don't be, know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's neither is wrong, but from him just for some reason made me giggle from him. Like he, like it was contagious almost. Yeah. I he think, got, he got pregnancy on her. Do you, <laughs> he sneezed think, from his penis. You're, made, <laughs> <laughs> you're making me think about how exchange students how we received them. And I remember one guy was from Spain and one guy was from Italy. And we definitely, they definitely came off and we definitely made gay jokes about them. They weren't gay. They definitely, women love them and they love women for sure. But they had a more of a feminine thing that we American boys didn't have and didn't love, I don't think, very much. I don't know. Oh, yeah. There's a, the sophistication. But there used to be a website in the early days of the internet called the European or Gay where they would show pictures of men and you had to guess whether they are Europeans or gay men. And there's also lesbian or Midwestern, which is the same (laughs) general principle. Oh, that's both. Those are real funny (laughs) and very judgmental. I wouldn't think they're funny at all, but Um, I'll probably laugh at them. No, but yeah, just the fact that I went to high school with a bunch of people from other countries and that they would wear slacks instead of jeans, things like just silly things like that, that just, ooh, you you must be sophisticated. You're wearing slacks on a Wednesday to yeah, school. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It felt the same way. It felt the same way. I was a lot worse than, than you were. You were a, more of a nonconformist and I was more of the conformist jock that you didn't like, I think. I was a performative nonconformist. If that, you know, we're, I mean, all, we're all, yeah, that's true. Aren't, aren't they all? I was a teenager, like all of us. Yeah. Muddling yeah. through, trying to hope people didn't notice how terrified I was of everything and everybody. Fair enough. My brother, as I think I probably told you, was a real nonconformist. I talked to him about it recently. I'm like, why bring yourself, why bring that horrible judgment and ire and bullying and, and, and even violence upon yourself? And he said something to the fact that he would rather be ridiculed than be unoriginal. And I bought it. Like it was insufferable to him to be like everybody else. And for me, it was going with the flow and uh, a lot less problems coming. my Yeah, I know. I know. I had kind of both impulses competing within me, but probably a little bit more like your brother. I wanted to think of myself as being like, I'm not like the other guys. Like I'm not like the other. I like I admire. I admire that, though. That's the way we should all be less inhibited and care less about. I mean, about. yeah, but it's all, yes, as long as you grow out of it. It's a very healthy phase to go through for a while. And then you get to a certain age where if you genuinely don't fit in and if you genuinely have interests that are outside the group, God bless you. But, like, you get a little less obsessed with broadcasting just how nonconformist you are. Like, that can be a bit tedious. Yeah, no, that's I know true. guys in their 30s and 40s and dare I say 50s who are still pulling that shit and they're ceaselessly exhausting. But you still yourself have an ambition for originality. That's something that you try to go for as much as you can within the worlds that you're in. I think it's fair to say. Sure. But I, I think it, at a certain point, if you're really following your own internal compass artistically or whatever, it will hopefully end up being something that is original. You'd think, who's to say, but I don't know. I'm not exactly reinventing the wheel, Pete. I don't think anybody's. I I, I don't think, but I don't think that's what you, yeah. But I think still within the work that you're doing, it's something that you strive for more than a lot of other people. Yes. Yes. To my detriment, it has not worked out super well for me, but uh, yes. It doesn't work out well always when you don't go with the flow. That's the point. Like you get a bigger audience or you have more quote success if you're like everybody else, if you're pleasing, whether it be a, 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 a serial or- but I also think I think some people just naturally I don't think that everyone who's popular necessarily is trying to be like everybody else. I think some yeah. people just no, no, they're lucky in the sense that their truest version of themselves just happens to fall into where the public is at a given 
point in history. No, there's a lot of people who are the only, the one and only in their originals. And they have, they're the most famous and they sell the most songs or works yeah, yeah. of art or whatever, like Picasso. Like, what the fuck is that about? But it's, I'm saying that it's harder and it's... I'm just not going to let you compliment me is what this gets down to, Pete. I think what we're really drilling down on here is that you keep trying to say something nice about me and I will make that impossible. <laughs> that's where, that's why you're so original. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I bring to the table. Self-loathing. Nobody's, nobody's ever heard of a self-loathing comedian before. Let's talk. Let's <laughs> speaking let's, of self-loathing. Let's, let's do, do it on a national level. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to let's pivot to what you and your wife are doing to help Kamala Harris get elected. It's important. And I want in specifically in Pennsylvania. First, what's Cambry doing and how are you supporting her? And my wife has taken a job with the Harris Walls campaign and she is helping organize New Yorkers who are taking buses out to Pennsylvania to canvas. There's obviously different field offices all over the country, but this is what she is focused on. And I am assisting in the sense there's a there's like a bunch of buses going out from Brooklyn and from Manhattan, from Queens and on Saturday and Sunday. And so I am being given like long lists of people to just literally confirm. I am what in what they call the confirm crew. And I was told it was pronounced confirm. I'm not entirely sure why, but I am part of the confirm crew which is basically just saying, hey, you said you were going to be on this bus. Can we count on you being there? Because, you know, it's sad. there's so many moving parts. It, it's not that I didn't know it before, but just seeing how just slammed Cambria is, and she's at the most entry level of this. It's just, it's such a machine. It's such a massive machine. And I think if Tom was able to hold on to Pennsylvania, I think you can thank my wife and by extension me. How do we, if we want to, thanks ahead of time for saving democracy single-handedly, but how do, how do we get on that bus or support her and your work there? You can. Let me find the exact link because I am not professional. Uh, I was just going to say how unprofessional you are for not having. I mean, we can obviously put the link in the show notes as well, well yeah. which uh, is more appreciate. work. Yes, I am. That, oh. that is my goal. You know how uh, to do show notes? You can go to go.kamalaharris.com slash resources slash battleground states help. Again. I'm, at, at, go ahead. No, that's go.kamalaharris.com slash resources slash battle, battleground states help. You can just go to kamalaharris.com and you can navigate yourself there. It'll be very clear and obvious. But this page lists all of the buses for in every part of the country, from the West Coast to the Midwest, to Mid-Atlantic, everywhere, and also carpool events that you can link up with and all sorts of stuff. And Or you can join the Confirm crew with me, which is something you can literally do from your laptop and phone. I've been doing this just all from the apartment. I will provide you that link. I don't have it on me at the moment, but I can provide you that link. And that's super easy. I love it. And that website has all the resources. Get trained, talk to voters, yes. make calls from home, connect with other supporters online, use the Reach app to talk to your friends and family, online engagement resources, a whole bunch. And I'll put that link in the show notes. Yes. How do we give me a little therapy? How are you dealing with the time between? There's 19 days or so left. And you're doing all you can, as we just learned. And I'll be in Pennsylvania and Michigan and doing whatever I can and hopefully making the tiniest of impacts because it helps me cope. It helps yeah, me. Yeah, honestly, it's like I've been pretty dejected, like I think a lot of people have the past week or so. Not just because I think the quote unquote movement in the polls is a bit overstated. I think that it's been pretty static for a few months, but just the fact that nothing seems to matter that it's like the guy can literally take a fucking dump in the middle of the stage and people be like, Oh, bold and innovative, you know, you know that nothing seems to break through it, which is just baffling and can be depressing. I, I am hopeful. Of course, if you're on social media, you can find people who will make you feel better and you can find people who will make you feel worse on the upside, it's like a lot of this early voting information and or new registrations would maybe make people feel a little optimistic 
about the way things are going. Yeah. But then you hear about Latinos not breaking for Harris the way they have for other Democrats. You can find whatever way you want to feel. You can find a way somebody to make. I have feel found. Like I think that's absolutely right. I feel like this week I start. It started not great notes with some polling that the Sunday shows were, were looking at that I you know don't think too much about. But then it's a bunch of other statistics broke that had me in early voting in Georgia and I think it was Pennsylvania had me really impressed and excited. And and then of course this round of interviews that Kamala Harris has done. But one more thing I thought was interesting, and, and maybe it just helps around the margins or something. Donald Trump doing that Univision town hall was, a was I think, a real mistake for him for a lot of reasons. But they actually asked some good questions. A lot of people are they saying – They were great. They were the great. Asked question, yeah. I'm a Republican voter, and I'm, I'm hoping you'll earn back my vote, basically asking him to apologize or, or show some kind of regret for January 6th. And, of course, Trump doubled down on – saying it was a day of a love fest and all that shit. And that clip went viral. And first of all, a lot of people are saying, why can't journalists do this job? I'm like, because they're not voters saying my vote hinges on your answer to this question. A and B, I'm going to defend journalists more. They have asked him that question plenty of times. He's been asked about January 6th. But that moment, the way it was with the Cuban Republican guy who looks pretty, quote, manly and everything, asking a, a fair question. I feel like that picks off a few people or ticks off a few people. Or January 6th was a game changer, I think for a lot of Trump supporters, they saw that with their own eyes, not unlike COVID. It's really hard to deny and lie people about. People forgotten, though. People, a lot of people have just forgotten. It's, it is crazy to see people act like we didn't all watch this. Like, we, like, they, who's to say whose fault it was or whether Trump, what Trump did do or didn't do or whether Pelosi didn't call the National Guard, what all this crap. We all watched this. We watched it on TV. Like, it's, people just have this motivated reasoning. But to get back to your original point, doing this work, just confirming people for dumb buses, like literally just texting people, has made me feel better. Great. It has definitely made me feel better. Great. So who's to say? I think I may have said this to you once before. I do think comedians and artists, artists, people in the performing arts in general, are a little bit better at limbo than people who work for a living and have more straightforward lives. Because we're always in that mode of, we don't know what six months from now is going to look like. I have no idea whether I'm going to be working my ass off and exhausted and just need a break, or if I'm just going to be completely sitting around my apartment pulling my pud, like who's to say? And so I do think that I'm a little more equipped to be miserable than maybe some other people are. But yeah, I, but I, I definitely find that the more I have to, that's tactile to do which I have a lot of between helping volunteer and also running QED while Cambry has this other job. I certainly, I feel busier than I have. Yeah, for no, I think it's a really good point. Probably you could just argue freelancers, people who might work a lot than not yeah. work as much. And having free time uh, allows you to, to worry and, and pontificate, and ruminate, and even catastrophize more. And that's true of all things in life. But we're in this 20 days left. And what does it mean for our lives if this monster were to get reelected? And what does it mean for our lives if she wins? It's There's such different outcomes in terms of how it affects so radical. Mood, yeah. or the economy, the Earth's climate, my daughter's bodies. There's so many things that matter that hinge upon it that are real. And but yet I'm mostly worried about the trans kid and whether or not they're going to play volleyball. That's the only thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But really, it, it's just so laughable seeing these people pretend they give a shit about women's sports. Like it's just That's it's one. so bald faced and just so insincere. <laughs> like, but whatever. In my town, they just announced that the moms for liberty have arrived. New moms for liberty in my town and pretty sure that it's being run by, by men, which is ironic. Mm -hmm. So I, I posted dear moms for Liberty in Rockland County and all of the men running and supporting this awful Christian extremist organization, men calling themselves moms. We know who you are and just want to say how we find delicious irony in the fact that you are so against boys transitioning to girls, <laughs> calling yourselves moms. Courage is hard to come by these days, but your cowardice is so ever present. That's hilarious. I didn't even, yeah, I didn't even think of that particular part of it. They're cosplaying women to come out against like, trans I people. Saw, 
I, I immediately try to find the arguments to my argument too. And it's, I support mom's demand, but mom's demand is not a gender based issue organization. Boys and girls get shot and shoot themselves. Yes. Like, it's, it's an mom- issue based or it's not, des- it's designed to actually tackle a, an actual issue. It's not using an issue as a wedge to win a political battle, which is what moms for Liberty is. And these people give two fucks. The moms for Liberty people, not one of them care about trans girls in sports or no, but but they don't care. They are using that as their entry point to try to gain political power. They are doing that. Like they, Mm -hmm. they are appendages of the conservative movement writ large. It's more, I thought you were going to say, and it is what you're saying. It's not about trans kids playing sports. It's about being trans. That's what it started. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because their first thing in our town was the bathrooms, and then they won on that, and so they're going further, and they're targeting one child, one child. I don't know how I feel about trans girls playing in girls' sports. I'm not really too comfortable with it with most sports. I think I have a nuanced opinion on that. But just on that specific thing with sports, I'm not quite sure about it. But I definitely support any trans person, any trans child living their truth, and however they want. It doesn't, like the gay issue, affect any of us. I know it affects parents and affects that kid, but I'm mostly always worried about the trans kid hurting or yes. self-harming themselves, not anything else. 100. 100%. And I, this is a bit of a leap, but... I- there's a comedian friend of mine who I worked with a few weeks ago who's a very nice guy, but he's he writes a substack and he's one of these guys who's like the I pick out problems in both parties. And I'm not oh, because he wrote something that I thought was dumb and I told him and he's oh, I guess I should just pick a tribe then and be happy with the rewards of being in one of the tribes. But I'm gonna still try to find fault in both parties. And it's first of all, those professional centrists, you are a tribe, first of all. You are absolutely a tribe, no more or less than Republicans or Democrats. And secondly, it's there's a difference between, I think, these dummies, and I'm including my friend when I say this, who say stuff like that, they act, they start from a point of what it, the, I want to brand myself, my personal brand is as a centrist, and I am the person who doesn't agree with either party. So I will find the center of wherever that is, no matter what the two parties are advocating for, which means that they're totally – it's incredibly easy for them to be gamed because all the Republicans have to do is just get more and more extreme and they will, the people, the quote unquote centrists will drift to the right just to be in the center still, as opposed to saying, what are my values as a human being? What are the things I believe in? And then matching up and saying, okay, which party matches my values more, which is the way it should be. Instead, they put the cart before the horse and they start from the position of, I want to be the kind of person who doesn't buy into what either party is saying. Now, what are my beliefs that then have to follow from that premise? It's, I fully agree. And I will only add, it's not, maybe the word centrist is, it it doesn't cover all of the people who just want to be either contrarian or not quote tribal, but all that's bullshit too, because of what you said about when I think about when I, when you first said that I cringed or reacted because I was like, I'm not, in a tribe, I'm for human rights. It doesn't yes. make me tribal. It, it, it's like being for civil rights and human rights is not a democratic party thing or a, a progressive thing or even a conservative. Thing. It shouldn't be. It's, it's just equal access, equal opportunity and rights as much as you can create and certainly not closing the door on people because of the, of the color of their skin, their gender, their yes. sexual orientation. That's not progressive. It's And also not all disagreements are created equal. Again, not to pick on my friend, but it's like the premise of his piece was that Indigenous Peoples Day was the, the Democrat version of MAGA, which is a kind of a bit of a, a, it's more of a take than an opinion. Everybody, my my definition of take is an opinion that makes you feel naughty. Uh, but, but, His whole thing is, oh, that's the same people trying to imagine that there was some previous world that was better and Native Americans were just as evil as anybody. And look at all these examples of tribes that slaughtered people, which is so goofy. But also it's like the people who are really strict about trying to use Indigenous Persons Day instead of Columbus Day. Okay, yes. Can they be a bit pedantic? Sure. Can it be a little annoying? Sure. But mostly they're college kids. And there's a difference between that and we need public executions, please, (laughs) which I will put my prediction, negative prediction down now. If Trump is reelected before the four years is out, there will be at least an attempt to have some sort of public execution on television. 
Where are you on that, public executions in general? It depends on the person. No. <laughs> <laughs> but there there will be that will be the that will be the new build the wall. It'll be oh. we need to have a live stream of some migrant rapist in in the in Marjorie Taylor Greene will ceremoniously break a champagne bottle on the electric chair like they would a new ship. There'll be some that will be that will happen within four years if Trump becomes president. Yeah, that's, that's a really it. Interesting prediction and not that far off and makes me wonder and want to talk more about public executions because I'd be lying if I didn't look up Saddam hanging that video that leaked. I was trying to mm-hmm. think if I ever looked for or wanted to see someone die. And I don't know that I wanted to see him. I don't support it ever. But I, I think, yeah, of I, course, yeah, we're all, we all have that morbid curiosity. Yeah, sure. Uh, what do you think about did you watch the Kamala Harris interview on Fox News? Did you do you have thoughts? I did, about actually. Put ahead of time. I wanted to ask you about it, but I did. And. Because of all the Botox and fillers, it's not possible for Brett Bayer's face to register any sort of embarrassment anymore, oh. which is lucky for him because thank you for what, what an embarrassing show. Yeah. Why do you think? What do you? Why do you think it was embarrassing? What do you mean? Because he clearly was trying to intimidate her, fluster her with just interrupting constantly, and it was very done in very bad faith. The, all he wanted to do was just read off Donald Trump's talking points and have her react to them, which, you know, OK, once or twice. Sure. You want to use the word borders are or you want to whatever you want to repeat some nonsense that Trump has sent into the, the Twitter sphere. Sure. But then she would try to answer. And yeah, is she the most concise speaker in the world? No, she's not. And is that strategic? Yes. And you know what that makes her a fucking politician. That's the way politicians communicate. You think Mitt Romney answered things in succinct 10 words or less fashion? No. Politicians filibuster. They tend, they speak longer than they need to, to see, but that's literally also, the way things are done. You also have to speak in such a way that your understanding of how media and news cycles work, meaning clips. Yeah. And both Brett Baer, he was, he said after the interview, I think she was trying to go viral in some clip. And I'm like, so are you like everybody is for their obvious own reasons. We all are to try to get a message across to communicate. That's how we communicate. She's trying to win the presidency. Are you like, there's a lot of people who do I get annoyed at watching Arby's employees do TikTok dances? Yes. Cause I don't need them to go viral. Do I need someone who's running to become president of the free world to go viral? Yeah, probably. That would probably be helpful. That (laughs) I don't like that Charlemagne guy very much. I don't like how much credit he's giving, being getting, given ever, but whatever. He's got a huge platform. And he was like giving her shit. He's like, you repeat the same talking points a lot. And she gave the best answer I feel like I've heard. But she was very honest. She's like, yeah, that's how you do it. You have to repeat things over and over everywhere you go. If you watch me every day, I can see where you think that's annoying. But I, that's how you do it. That's how yeah. you communicate. It's why you see the same commercial to sell anything over and over and it's why politicians repeat themselves over and over because that's how it works there's a lot of science on this this is effective and i just loved her answer by not being like shy away from it She's like, yeah you have to repeat yourself to get the point across to larger audiences that's yes i, I think you could make the same complaint quote unquote complaint about literally anybody who's ever run for public office in any context one of the things i think is super weird is this blame on almost anybody, Republican or Democrat, but certainly on Democrats, that the reason these young, beautiful, blonde, white Americans were killed by these monsters, undocumented people, is because of a Democrats' policy of letting them in. In fact, if you pass the legislation, it would be so much easier to have judges to go through these things, have border security, do everything. From being victims of the few that might commit crimes. Obviously, most do not. And furthermore, why is it only Democrats' fault when an undocumented person, it's their fault that someone gets killed? It's not, it's never Republican fault for any of the litany of policies from health insurance to fossil fuels to the wars that they get blamed for people's deaths that you really can't, if you're going to commit to this policy or not, people are going to be in danger. People are going to die. And I feel like Republicans never get the blame, say for gun violence or other things where they don't get those questions the way that she did. I feel like that's such an unfair, ridiculous question, but still she answered it with empathy and intelligence in my mind. But you have thoughts about that whole strategy? 
it's not a it's not a surprise to me. And it's just one of those things where it's like you can wish things were fair, but they're just not. And I think part of that is the conservative worldview as opposed to the progressive worldview is conservatives tend to want to protect the in group from the out group and progressives want to try to help the out group become the in group, become a part of the in group. And so it's, it doesn't behoove Republicans to do any, to humanize immigrants in any way, shape or form, because they're much more useful as a, a villain or as a sort of dark force that you can't know, that you don't know, that makes no sense to you, that they have the same values as you. They're space aliens, as far as you're concerned. Who knows what they might do? They're wild animals. This is literally the, the terms that are using, being used now. And when you're of the opinion of, no, deep down, we're all people, and we should try to find the humanity in each other and, and help people become a part of the, quote unquote, American project, you then open yourself up to those attacks when a migrant or someone from another country commits a crime or does something awful because you've tried to be nuanced about it and you've tried to be inclusive. You've tried to actually honor the premise upon which America is based, which is that give us your tired report. Obviously, I know that's not wasn't the founding documents. It's been our motivating yeah, spirit for the sure. last 150 years. Result. Yeah. If you don't know that at this point where we all came from, just by going back to Columbus Day, it's always just as an Italian, I get so triggered and offended by like other Italians who are like, that's our day. Shut up. We don't have a day and we don't need a day. Like St. Patrick's Day for the Irish and we could have something, but it's, it's I feel that. Make a new day. Make a new day. Call it fucking I, I, Leonardo I like, DiCaprio I, day. I don't know, whatever. I don't know. Is, do the Italians take credit for Leonardo DiCaprio? Um, Is he the most un-Italian guy? Of all time. Italian. His dad must be Italian. You couldn't have a more Italian name. I saw some viral thing that says that said he and a bunch of other celebrities have been out of the country since Diddy got arrested. <laughs> yeah, that's one. That's one I wouldn't shock. Honestly, it would. I don't on know one hand, it would shock me Leonardo DiCaprio just because he's been swimming in it since he was 15. Yeah. But I mean, by it, I think you female genitalia. <laughs> yeah. But again, a lot of times those guys, those dudes who are rich and wealthy and have the world at their fingertips, they get into crazy, yeah. gross stuff because they're nothing a else gets them going. Aspersions on this great Italian American. <laughs> so close to Columbus Day. So close to Columbus Day. <laughs> All right. We're so close to Election Day. Uh, anything else that you're watching or that's gone that you paid particular close attention to or reacted to that you wanted to comment uh, on? The new season of Slow Horses is very good. Oh, okay. All right. That's a show on oh. Apple TV. It's a British. It's like the bad news bears of British intelligence. Like they're, it's about all these sort of washout British, British intelligence agents who. A British spy thriller television series based on slow house series of novels by Mick Heron. It's a British series. They're on season four right now. And it's because it's a British show. The episode, the seasons are only six episodes long, which is perfect. Why do British shows have that number of episodes? That's just the way British TV has always been. I think they call it a cycle there. Oh, they don't have the way that America. The same way. Well, America used to be 13 episodes, used to be like a standard oh. TV season. Um, but then now with streaming, everything's just gone wonky. All right. Maybe I'll take a, a look at that. I feel like Gary Oldman's in it. Chris and Scott Thomas, who oh. I love and everything. Yeah, it's good stuff. Any other references or suggestions from the great Finnegan? Anything else? I don't know, man. I'm playing the new Star Wars video game. On what platform do you? The PlayStation number five. It's called ah. Star Wars Outlaws. It's it's a great way to throw 70 or so hours down the toilet. <laughs> if you are looking to do that. And as always, subscribe to New Music for Olds. Number six. Oh, yeah, that too. Was the last issue. And do you have anything to say about the music of Billie Eilish? I like Billie Eilish. I wouldn't, I think honestly, for as much as we talk crap about pop culture or whatever, I think pop culture, if you're like a 14 year old girl specifically, is in a better place than it's been certainly in my lifetime. If Billie Eilish and Taylor Swift and Olivia Rodrigo, and if these are like the biggest stars, biggest pop stars in the world, that's pretty good. They're all like talented and they actually write music and they do interesting stuff. And I don't know. It, it's a lot more 
admirable than a lot of the crap that was popular when I was 15. So I'm not saying that I didn't bring my daughters to any concerts or enough concerts, but I am saying when I took them to Madison Square Garden and dropped them off last night, they said, wait, it's not outdoors. Really? Well, that is a garden. Wow. Yeah. Yikes. Yep. <laughs> How, they didn't know Madison Square Garden was inside. Well, they're both Al-Qaeda members. They don't know a lot, apparently. What? Yeah, I never took them to a sports thing like that either. They would never go to a sports event. Never try to tell them who's in Grant's tomb. <laughs> 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 I don't know if that's the right All right, buddy, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks, dude. Yeah, you always like to end on a laugh, so I took my opportunity. Always great with Christian Finnegan. Go follow him, go support him, go subscribe to New Music for Olds. That would be awesome. That's all I've got for you today, and I may be here this weekend. I may not be. I may drop something. I might not. I like it to be a surprise, but you get five days of great interviews this week. Two shows had two guests. And every show had a news update. I was a little late on a couple of them, including today, delivering them by midnight or the next deadline is 6 and the final deadline is 9 a.m., which makes it 6 on the West Coast. So at least I got it up for you folks out there early enough today. But those are the rules that I tried to play by each and every week. I'd say there I didn't hear anything about editing mistakes or sound issues this week. If there were any, uh, feel free and comfortable to let me know about that or anything else you'd like to hear. And what women, you bumblebees, what women guests would you like to hear on the show that you think I can get next week because I'd love to uh, talk to more ladies it's been pretty uh, pretty dude heavy lately and I want to uh, get some names that we've had on before and some people some new names always love as well to see platform new voices as well so let me know stand up with Pete at gmail.com that's all that's it that's all of it John Carroll.org that's our guy he writes and performs the music we love him and here he is Bye, Bumblebees. John Patton. That's for you. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans for a stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up All right, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no one to try and rise up Show obedience to the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide It says stand up 